Well, uh, welcome to Lighthouse for Jesus Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, thank God for all of you who have joined us. Last week, we began Leviticus 9. Again, before we get started, uh, I want to reiterate that studying the Old Testament is important because it helps us to understand the New Testament in a totally different way. And the whole Bible is important, not just certain parts, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. The Old Testament is a type and shadow and the New Testament is where we see clearly, where everything is revealed to us that was said in the Old Testament. So we have now gotten to the book of Leviticus and uh, what we had last week in chapter nine was the first offerings of Aaron and his sons. We know that in Leviticus eight, they were ordained and consecrated as priests and Moses officiated doing the uh, offerings and the sacrifices. And he did so for seven days. And then in chapter nine, uh, Aaron and his sons began to do the sacrifices. Actually, I think that those seven days of consecration uh, for their ordination was practice for how they were to officiate for the people of God. Uh, so last week we did go over those, uh, the beginnings of Aaron and his sons making sacrifices for themselves. We only read to verse seven, I believe. We're not going to read verses eight through 21. Uh, we're going to just briefly discuss those, but we're going to read verse, verses 22 through 24. But uh, after Aaron first act, which was bring the sin offering and the burnt offering for himself again, we need to know that before we can uh, minister to anybody else, we have to make sure that we are right with God. And that's what that sin offering and that burnt offering was that uh, Aaron was doing. Uh, we have to be in right relationship with God in order to serve the people to, to show them how to have a right relationship with God. Uh, this was the beginning of his service as a priest. And he slaughtered the sacrifice and his sons carried out the rest of what they were supposed to do. And uh, it was a, uh, a young bull for Aaron, but it was a goat that they did for the people because after the sacrifice for them, they had to offer sacrifices for the people. There was, uh, why would there be a difference? A young bull for the priest and a goat for the people. And that is because, and this is something we really need to understand that the sin of the priest was of far greater consequence than the sin of the people. And that is kind of a sticky subject because we, we like to think that sin is sin and sin is sin, but then sin isn't sin in the sense of sin is not all the same because God classifies sins. And that is something you really see in the Old Testament that some are more serious than others. And when a sin is more serious, that means it's more dangerous. And the sacrificial system shows us those things. And of course, again, we don't actually do those things now, but 
they teach us some very important lessons. Uh, there was a hierarchy of animals that showed the classifications of sin in the offering. The, uh, the bull being most valuable for the most serious sins and the birds being the least. Now that doesn't mean that we're supposed to run around comparing sins. <laughs> we are not supposed to be doing that and decide who has the worst sin. But what we do need to see is that sin is multifaceted. It can affect and it can if infect those who come into contact with it, and it can become very serious and very devastating, not just to that person in sin, but to those around that person. And we're also going to see that in the, uh, the next chapters of how uh, they had to be quarantined when, in, in order for sin not to be contagious. It is not just the way we think of it. And I guess our New Testament way of looking at it is a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. So sometimes we do say, you know, that all sins are the same before God, that there aren't any little sins, there aren't any big sins. Technically, that's not true. God even classifies sin as sin, transgression, iniquity, abomination. So we need to understand that stealing a candy bar is different than murdering someone. Now, they are both sin. Paul tells us in the New Testament that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Paul is speaking of our sin nature, which is corrupt. And the inevitable result of that sin nature, that that nature can never be acceptable to God. That is why our nature that we are born with has to be born again. Wow, that is so awesome to know. So there has never been a human except for Jesus who has never committed any sin because we all have a corrupt nature. We're all born in sin and we're all shaped in iniquity. So we're all in the same boat when it comes to that. So the Levitical sacrificial system demonstrates that principle that Paul is talking about by means of that sin nature. So that's why they had to have sacrifices every day. No one was exempt, not even the priesthood. The nature of men is a separate issue from the behavior of men. So when Paul was talking about the fact that we have all sinned and come short of God's glory, he was talking more about who we are and less about what we do. Who we are is the same among all men in God's eyes until we are saved. We're all equally guilty of being born with that sin nature. But what we do is another matter. God does not equate stealing a candy bar with murder, as I said before. He doesn't equate telling a lie with committing adultery. What we do, what we do, D-O, is categorized with some of our acts being less serious offenses and others being, can go all the way to an abomination, which is the worst kind of sin. 
we don't have to wonder about which is which. The Bible tells us which is which. If we read it with revelation and wanting to know what it says, and if we read all of the Bible, even though the classification for sins remains in effect to this day, where there are less serious and more serious uh, disobediences. Today, the sacrifice to atone for each of these, no matter how little or how big, is the same. And that is the blood of Jesus because it has replaced every sacrificial procedure. He is our atonement. But the fact is that sinful behavior can be more serious or less serious. It can be more offensive to God or not as offensive to God and more uh, dangerous to the community of God, to the church, to the body, or it could be you know, more or less. That is still true. So we know those things. And now we're gonna read uh, Leviticus 9 verses 22 through 24, so we can finish this chapter and get to chapter 10. Okay, uh, Sister Tiffany, if you would read verses 22 through 24. Verses 22 to 24. And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar, the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Okay, so after these offerings and sacrifices were done, Aaron blessed the people. And then Aaron and Moses went into the tabernacle of the congregation. Well, they, they came out before they blessed the people. And at the beginning of this chapter, I believe we read that there was going to be something different that the, the glory of the Lord was going to appear into the people. And that is what happened. The glory of the Lord appeared unto the people. Doesn't tell us if it was the cloud or if it was uh, a bright shining light or we just know that it was the glory of God because God was so pleased with what they had done. And when the glory of God came, it overwhelmed the people. Because when the glory came, after that, a fire came. It says, a fire, there came a fire out from before the Lord. Now we know that the Lord. The glory of the Lord was dwelling between the cherubim in the Holy of Holies. And it says that that fire came out from before the Lord. It came from the Holy of Holies and consumed that which was upon the altar. That is the fire that came straight from God and lit the brazen altar where the sacrifices were. That is that fire that God wanted in his uh, tabernacle, a fire from him. You see, there's a lot of fire going around in churches, but is it the fire from the Lord? When that fire comes, it's very hard to stand on your feet. It says that the people shouted and they fell on their faces in worship before the Lord, you know, 
we know that we feel fire at Lighthouse. We know that there are times that we cannot even stand. And we shout and we praise God. And sometimes we fall on our faces. And so many people don't understand that because they have never felt that fire. But when you, when you have felt it, you understand what is happening here in chapter nine. Uh, that fire was not just for them. It is for us as well. God has all of that for his body. So we're going to go to chapter 10, which we're going to see uh, our title. For those of you who weren't here when we got started, uh, our series title is uh, Holy, Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, H-O-L-Y. And the subtitle for the last three weeks has been the uh, A Holy Priesthood. But the subtitle tonight from chapter nine to chapter 10 is An Unholy Priesthood. It can happen so quickly. That's why we need to really be careful, right? So. Brother Rogers, if you would read verse, uh, no, Exodus, actually. Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 through 38. And I will read Exodus 19 and 22. And then Sister Tiffany, if you would read Leviticus 10 verses 1 through 7. Okay, our first one is Exodus 30 verses 34 through 38. And the Lord said to Moses, take unto thee the spices, stacked in Anika and Galbanum, these sweet spices with the pure frankincense of each shall there be a, be a light weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume a confection after the order of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of, put, of, put of it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, you shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell there too shall even be cut off from his people. Okay. So here we see the recipe for the incense. Tempered together, pure and holy. That is what they are to use in the tabernacle. And nobody else can make it, copy it. It's only holy unto the Lord. There's a lot of fake incense. Uh, the Lord gives us a warning that if it's fake, that those who do that, it will be, they will be cut off from the people. So we need to know that before we go to chapter 10. And in Exodus 19 and 22, it says, and let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Okay, here we see the warning to the priests to sanctify themselves or the, the Lord is going to punish them or kill them. He's gonna break forth upon them. 
And we know that we are New Testament priests, as it tells us in 1 Peter. We are a royal priesthood. Then we go to Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 7. Please, Sister Chippy. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is that the Lord spake saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and to Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Praise God. How many of you know that being a part of the priesthood is a dangerous job? It's a dangerous job. And how many of you know that God is not playing with us? If we are priests of God, he is not playing with us. He has told us and he has warned us, have we paid attention? So this chapter 10 follows that glorious day of dedication in chapter nine. We don't know how much time had elapsed between the end of chapter nine and the beginning of chapter 10. It could have been the same day or it could have been a week, some days. However, it wasn't a very long period of time that had elapsed. But when we look at the presumption of Nadab and Abihu, it's frightening because they had just been taught repeatedly about what they were supposed to do and what they were not supposed to do. They were not supposed to do anything except what Moses told them that God said to do. And whatever it was, we're told, but we're not given all of the details, we're left to wonder about some details. All we know is that it was a violation that angered Jehovah so greatly that he cremated Adab and Ab Abihu, Aaron's sons. The main reason that God was so angry was because they treaded on the one thing that God will never allow to be violated. And that is his holy. That which the church world today has treated as less than important is what God does not allow to be violated. He says, be ye holy, why? because I'm holy and you cannot come near to him if you are not holy.
To be a priest means to come near him, to come near, to be close. And he says, you have to be holy to do that. We want the priest part. We don't want the holy part. We just read where it says in verse three, he says, this is it that the Lord spake saying, I will be sanctified that come to in them that come near me. I will be glorified. No question about it. Are we walking that way? As if we're realizing that God said, I will be sanctified in my priest. I will be glorified in my priest. Are we walking any kind of way? Are we doing any kind of thing? Are we holy? If we've been authorized to come near him, he's telling us I will be treated as holy. And if we've been honored to serve him, we are held to a higher standard in the church, but the priesthood that is the church is to show that honor and sanctification and holiness to the rest of the world. Because if we who are to walk as priests show carelessness and how we treat God, what will the common ordinary people think of us or of God for that matter? And we also see in, and I, I, I forgot to mention this before, but we see that the Old Testament priesthood in the sense of sacrifices, rituals, it's all that now is done away with. That part of the law, the, the I, I think I've said that, the rituals and the ceremonial things, they were, Jesus Christ came and he did away with all of those things, but the principles is what we need to know and we need to walk by because those are still relevant. So there is no officiating priesthood in the sense of offering for the people in that sense. So Nadab and Abihu had a great legacy in the sense of spiritual experiences. So being a part of great spiritual experiences does not stop you from being stupid. They saw firsthand all of those miracles that God did to bring them out of Egypt. They saw all of this, they were present. They heard the voice of God and saw the fire and the lightning and the smoke on Mount Sinai and they felt the thunder and the earthquakes at Sinai. They went up on Sinai with Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders. They had a special meeting with God. They saw as much as can be seen of God. And they ate and drank and fellowship. They had been chosen for the priesthood. So this shows us though, that even a legacy of great spiritual experiences can't keep us right with God. And we have seen that from experience. Only an abiding ongoing relationship that is grounded in the truth of God's word can. Because all of those miraculous things, all of the excitement, all of the, 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 the great feelings that 
overwhelm us, the, the, those great spiritual experiences that can be real, really real, if we are not grounded in the truth of God's word. If we have been grounded in the experiences instead of the word, that cannot keep you right with God. They came in an unauthorized way. That word, strange fire. Well, we're going to talk about it some more later, but it means unauthorized. There's a lot of unauthorized things going around. <laughs> they came according to their own preference to God, like Cain. It goes all the way back that people going to try to do God the way they feel God ought to want them or let them come. You can't do that. You are not bigger than God. We have to come to God, God's way. It can look good for a very long time. So everything these two men did was wrong. First of all, they were the wrong people to be handling that incense and presenting it to the Lord. That was Aaron's job. That was not their job. They also used the wrong instruments. They used their own censors instead of the censor for the high priest that had been sanctified by the holy anointing on. They acted at the wrong time because the only time that was supposed to be the, the, those uh, uh, that was supposed to be brought to the Holy of Holies was on the Day of Atonement and only by the high priest. They acted under the wrong authority. The authority was Moses and Aaron. They didn't do it according to the word of God, which is at that time was those instructions given by Moses and Aaron. And in burning that incense, they used the wrong fire. Very, very bad, unauthorized fire. Fire that did not come through God or from God and fire also that did not come through Moses and Aaron. We sometimes think that our own fire is so good and so much better than that which the leaders have instructed us to use. We're going to make our own fire because we're going to act in an unauthorized way. We're going to act in a way that says that I can do this. Why am I waiting? Why do I have to wait? You know, that, that's a spirit that's in people who say, I'm not being used. It's time for me to do this. And it's time for me to do that. God has an order. They also acted from the wrong motive, which is they weren't seeking to glorify God. Because when we seek to glorify God, we do it God's way. They were not trying to sanctify God and glorify God. They were trying to promote themselves. They were trying to be important. And if you listen to people who do those things and go that way, if you really listen, there's a lot in what they're saying. There's a lot of pronouns there. I, me, I, me. And then they depended upon the wrong energy. Because when we get to verses nine and 10, Aaron is going to tell them, is going to say that you can't drink. So it's an implication that they were under the influence of alcohol. In Ephesians, the word tells us to be drunk in the spirit, not on wine or alcohol. And you know, we can really get drunk on flesh. 
Flesh can make you drunker than alcohol. If God would take the Holy Ghost out of this world, people would still be in church doing everything they was doing before and never miss the Holy Ghost because they're not doing it in the Holy Ghost anyway. They wouldn't even know the difference because it's flesh, drunk on flesh. Strange fire. They offered strange fire, unauthorized fire. Fire that was against the order that the word gave. Fire that was against the order of the tabernacle or the church. They violated all of that. It was unauthorized. People need to stop believing that God is going to skip over leadership to give you all these instructions to do what you want to do. Right now, the church is not a body in so many ways because all the body parts want to be the same part, the head. So you don't have all the other parts working together because everybody wants to be a head. They showed carelessness. They showed irreverence. They showed a lack of consideration for God. So such a tendency as that had to be punished at the beginning of what at the beginning of uh, uh, the sacrificial system. There had to be something for the other priest to see as a warning not to do the same thing. So serving God, it requires, first of all, the right approach to God, the right source for God's power, and the right spiritual attitude. Nadab and Abihu failed to see the mind of God and acted in self-will. I will, which is a satanic principle when we are saying, I will. That is what Satan said. This shows us the use of carnal and natural means to kindle fire for our devotion and for our praise and for our service that are man-made. That word strange in strange fire also means profane and it means to commit adultery. This is spiritual adultery because it was a fire that was not kindled from the altar of burnt offering. So if it was not kindled from the altar of burnt, off, uh, of burnt offering or the brazen altar, it wasn't associated with what the brazen altar represented, which was the death of Jesus on the cross. That fire did not come from the atoning and the redeeming work of Christ. It's easy to say fire is fire. As long as it burns, it's okay. No. That was a deadly mistake for Nadab and Abihu. The fire in the altar of burnt offering was sacred because it was kindled by God himself. Remember, a fire came out from before the Lord. They offered a fire of their own making. All fire isn't the same. And there's a huge difference between the fire that's kindled by God and the fire that's kindled by man. Nadab and Abihu had been instructed in the things of 
the sanctuary along with Aaron. And they knew how important it was to keep every little detail. It doesn't tell us where they got that fire from. It just tells us that it was not the right fire. It was strange fire. We do know that whatever it was, it was not, or wherever it came from, it was not offered God's way. It has to be done God's way. Our senses. Are we offering strange fire? How much of what we do for the Lord is out of self-will or self-promotion? Sometimes we seek to worship God, but the reason we're worshiping him is to see only what we can get, not what we can give. And a lot of times I, I, I think that, well, this is important. And of course we all want to receive from God, but worship is not primarily about what we receive. Worship is about giving to him. We should not make ourselves more important than him. When we rush into his presence, are we subordinated to his will? Are we burning strange fire? And you know, we don't need to forget that Satan can deceive with fire. Let's go to Revelation, Revelation 13 and 13. Revelation 13 and 13 says, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come from fire come down from heaven on the earth in the, in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, we see there that the devil can send fire. The beast is going to send fire. And a lot of church people are going to be deceived. We want to know what is church fire. I mean, what is fire sent from God and what is not. The devil can't come up with anything new, but he can imitate. He is a good imitator. And we need to think about it. How many sermons are strange fire? How many praise dance teams that you see are operating under strange fire? How many praise team singers are operating under strange fire? How many new ministries are being started with strange fire? Those that are being kindled by your own desires that aren't in submission to God, not in submission to the word, not in submission to your oversight. God has an order in his body. And we, when we operate in our own will, and when we don't want to submit to someone's authority, just because we don't like what they say or how they say it, we are offering strange fire. It says before the Lord. So obviously they went into the Holy of Holies because that is where the Lord well, so that same fire that is in chapter 9, verse 24, and there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. A fire came out from before the Lord. 
So that same fire that is in Leviticus 9 and 24 is the fire that is in Leviticus 10 and 2. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Wow. So the same fire that showed God's glory and lit the brazen altar is the same fire that is now judgment on Nadab and Abel. The same fire that came from God to show his glory and accept the sacrifices is the same God that killed them. I said before, the priesthood is a dangerous job. If you want to draw near, be near to God, you need to be holy. And of course, God does not strike us dead right now, but some of us don't even know that spiritually we are dead, all in the sense of we walking around with our own strange fire in the flesh. Again, also, it is believed that they had been drinking and they were attempting to administer uh, or to minister in the tabernacle under the influence of alcoholic beverages. So many things we now think are okay to do as church people. We say we can drink a little wine, we can drink a little as long as we don't get drunk. Huh. Anyone who's been an alcoholic, I have not been, but anyone who's been an alcoholic can tell you that there is no such thing. Why would we tell someone who is saved, who has come into the body of Christ and had a problem with alcohol that they can drink a little bit? Why would we do that? And it impairs your judgment. And God does not want it in his priesthood. Nadab and Abihu were without excuse. They had been trained. I will say that again. They had been trained. They had been taught. They weren't just anybody. They were in authority. The people of God were looking at them, looking at what they were doing. Think about that. Who are we affecting? in the things that we do or don't do anymore. It makes an impression and the blood is on our hands. Most people will acknowledge that Jesus is the savior and that, uh, that they believe in him, but very few of them want to acknowledge the fact that he's also our judge. Jesus came and died for us as our savior. But when he comes back, he's coming to judge us. The same God who blesses if his commandments are kept is the same God who will judge if they are not kept. As I said before, the same fire that was the fire of glory, came a couple of verses later as a fire of judgment. Just like the flood water with Noah, the same water that killed humanity was the water that saved Noah and his family.
So God started off with this part of, of uh, the Israel as a nation learning what was right and what was wrong with judgment. And many times we would say, well, God would not do that today. That was Old Testament. That is not true. Next week, we're going to talk about the fact that God started off the dispensation of grace with the same kind of judgment in the New Testament church with Ananias and Sapphira. Instant judgment. It ought to teach us a lesson, and we are going to talk about that next week. Old Testament judgment versus New Testament judgment. Are there any questions or comments?